So Karen Huell is a content strategist and certified OUXer joining us from the lovely Phoenix, Arizona. Before she became a professional word nerd, she was an ESL teacher, which I did not know that. And that makes total sense. My mom was an ESL teacher for a while. So um, definitely a word nerd. And um, Karen was in cohort seven. Um, we basically jived from the first minute. I kind of knew I was like, she's going to be teaching me stuff. Um, I knew very, very early on. So I am very, very excited to learn from Karen. Um, before I jump into my slide deck, y'all, Welcome to OUX Happy Hour. Let's all, if you have a glass, raise your glass and cheers. Happy OUXing, y'all. Cheers. All right. So, yes, the R of ORCA, ORCA is Objects, Relationships, CTAs, and Attributes. We're really going to be focusing on that R pillar right now in five ish, maybe 10 minutes. Let's see how fast I can do this. So, why? We're going to talk a little bit more about the why, but the main why for why we are obsessed with relationships in the OAUX world is because we want to avoid something we like to call isolated objects. So there are four different unintuitive objects that we talk about in the OAUX world. You can learn about them in the Unity course or the masterclass. But we're going to focus on these isolated objects. These are objects that are disconnected from their related objects. So we have these mental models and we can map these mental models using something like this. We call it a system model or entity relationship diagram. So this is from the National Park Service, um, which I recently got the privilege of working with. And when you think of a national park, you've got visitor centers, you've got cool points of interest like waterfalls, you've got campgrounds and you've got trails and a bunch of other stuff. But that's kind of like the core of this mental model. And they're all connected. All right. Now, if you go to the National Park Service website, you can see a point of interest like Cades Cove at the Great Smoky Mountains. And within this Cades Cove page, you can see that there is hiking there. And you can download a park map, which gives you all of the hiking in the entire park. Um, there's a visitor center with stuff at that visitor center. And there's camping as well. Now, throughout the website, you actually have trails. You have a page that gives you everything about the visitor center, like your directions to the visitor center and hours and amenities. You've got a campground page where you can book your campground. But the connections that are in the mental model are not manifested in the screens. Okay. I can't actually navigate. So I can't even from the Cades Grove campground, I can't navigate back to Cades Cove as the point of interest, I can't see all the trails that can get me to Cades Cove or that are around Cades Cove. The connections are not made, okay? Um, here's another one. Health Catalyst is another uh, organization that I got to work with recently. And on their marketing page, they've got leaders and then they've got content, all right? So Dan Orns. Orenstein here, um, he's got this big, beautiful bio. He's general counsel. And if I go to a whole other part of the website, I can actually see another bio of Dan with all of the content that he's created, all right? Or if I can go to, I can go to the content and I can actually click on one of these content pieces and see Dan, but I can't get back to this whole bio. So this bit of the mental model that people, leaders within Health Catalyst create content and content is created by leaders is completely disconnected. Okay, so this is what we're trying to avoid. What we're trying to do is we're trying to map out those real world connections so that then we can manifest them on our screens because this is the most intuitive way for our users to navigate. Let's just navigate through the relationships that are just out there in the world, all right, that are and in our heads and our mental models. Okay, so the OUX law of relationships is real world relationships should be reflected in the digital navigation. And these artifacts, what Karen's going to be going through, the navigation flow is a way to start visualizing that. We've got a couple other things before we get to the nav flow. Okay, so the ORCA process that I mentioned. So as an OAUXer, system thinker overall, we want to answer these questions before we design screens. Before we start getting into UI, we want to get into what are the objects of the user's mental model? What are the objects' relationships to each other? What are the calls to action? that users can basically take uh, to take part on on these objects. So what do the what do the objects offer up as far as capabilities to the end users? And then what are the attributes that make up those objects? And this aligns to Orca, which is our that stack of tools 
there's a linear process, but we can remix it. It can sometimes be the Oprah process. That's okay too. All right. So the ORCA process is iterative. So we tackle those questions in rounds. So we go through a discovery round where we're just really have a bunch of tools that help us ask really amazing questions. Okay, so we tackle the O, the R, the C, and the A as far as discovery and just try to feel out what's going on. What kind of level of complexity are we dealing with? Then we go into requirements, which I call is practicing UX at high resolution. So in Joe and I's Udemy course, we don't get into the requirements round. This is the advanced stuff that's in the master class. Um, then we get into prioritization, which we barely touch on in the Udemy course. We get to it. We just give you like the highlight reel there. And then the master class is more of that. But we go into prioritization where we can prioritize the O, the R, the C, and the A from a user perspective, as well as from a roadmap perspective. How are we actually going to build this thing? And then we bring it all together in sketching and prototyping and testing. So we've got these four rounds, but we can mix them up and we can mix things around. Um, now, let's just focus on this R pillar, especially with these first three steps. So we've got the nested object matrix. That's the, one of the main artifacts um, in discovery. And then we've got my cat saving fire department, which we're just going to talk a little bit about. So that is a loaded step right there. And then we've got relationship prioritization where we go into the nap flow. Okay, so that's what I'm trying to get you to where I, I can hand it off to Karen. Okay, so let's look at the nested object matrix and let's look at an app you're probably very familiar with, which is Meetup, okay? So Meetup has groups and basically we can look at the other objects, all right? Let's just look at groups, events, and people, okay? And what we do in our nested object matrix is we take our objects across the x-axis and then we take the exact same objects down the y-axis and we map those relationships using cardinality okay and usually i'd spend a lot more time talking about this but basically i can start saying the truth about this system a group has zero to many events that are upcoming and past and draft a group has zero to many people in it an event has one group parent a person has zero to many groups that they are a member of and zero to many groups that they organize. Okay. Uh, ooh, a person to person. A person has zero to many people with shared groups. Okay. So I can start doing kind of a gap analysis. And this actually is a much more scalable diagram than like an entity relationship diagram, which is really great when you have five or six objects max. But imagine if you have 12 objects or in some of the systems that I've worked on, imagine you have 150 objects. This you can actually build a nested object matrix for 150 objects in Airtable, not in Keynote, <laughs> in Airtable or Notion, not Keynote. Um, but you can do that. You can do that in are these kind of advanced spreadsheet spreadsheet uh, tools that are available to us now. Okay, so we take that nested object matrix. And then we bring it into relationship requirements. So relationship requirements, uh, we look at every single nested object and we look at the mechanics of that uh, nested objects. So we think about how does groups have similar groups? What does it need to be similar? What kind of algorithm are we actually building? Um, how do people actually join groups? We think about the mechanics. We think about the cardinality in, in an even deeper fidelity. And then we talk about sorts and filters and dependencies. And right now, I'm just going to give you a little sampling of sorting and filtering. So we talk about the default sorts. So if I'm looking at a group and I'm seeing, for example, um, all the events, What's the sorting? Okay, it's probably going to show the most recent at top. So some of these are really obvious. Sometimes it's not so obvious. What about if I'm showing all the people in a group? What's the default sort? Do I show the most active person at the top? Is it relative to the end user? And do I show the person that maybe you would like to connect with, like that you have the most shared groups with? There's all sorts of ways we can sort that list within the context of a group. And then we have other sort options. So can the user switch it? So there's a default sort, and then there's a ways that they can switch it out. And then there's additional filters as well that we can map. And we can say, okay, if I'm looking at all the people in a group, I should be able to see all members versus the leadership team. Or if I'm looking, for example, at the group has zero to many events, what if I'm looking at all the past events? Could I check a box or something and just say, just show me the events that I went to? How many events have I actually gone to for this particular, like, oh, you X happy hour? Have I RSVP'd yes to 10, five? So that might play out in the UI, something like this. So if I'm just looking at a group has zero to many events and this idea of having an extra filter, just show events I went to. 
So right now you can't do that on Airbnb. Airbnb? <laughs> you can't do that on Meetup. Um, so what it would do is if I decided this with my team, right? And with did you re research, right? To make sure like, is this a valid thing that we actually want to do? It might look something like this, right? Some sort of checkbox or toggle to be able to say, just show the ones that I've RSVP'd yes to. All right. So now we get into the nav flow. Um, so in the nav flow, basically we're going to go back to our nested object matrix and maybe we have additional information on my cat sitting fire department because we're probably not in keynote by this point, we're probably in notion or air table. Um, so we have additional information. We really explored each of these nested objects. And now when we get to prioritization, we can prioritize them and we can start saying which relationships should be near the top and which relationships should be near the bottom. Okay, what, what nested objects for a group are going to be the most important. Some of our nested objects might even fall off completely. We might say, you know what, that's not for, that's going to be for phase two, all right, or phase three or something, or we just decide it's not, we research it and we say, actually, people don't really care about that. We don't need to put that in there. All right, so once we prioritize these and we have a really good grasp on them, we can start visualizing through this navigation flow. So, the nav flow, we think about what is the top navigation, which there's many ways to design a top navigation. The way that I usually start with is by thinking about the objects. Surprise, surprise. This is what I found is usually the most easy for people to understand because I can look at the top of a screen or the side of a screen, whatever, wherever it is. I can look at that persistent navigation that's going to lead to the main lists of these things or landing pages. And I can really get, it's almost like a, a map. Like I can say, okay, here's all the stuff that is in this place. So groups, events, and people, even if I didn't know it was meetup, I'd kind of have an idea on what this is all about, right? And those will usually go to some sort of list page, okay? And so because I've been thinking about the sorts and the filters, I can start putting some information on, okay, how might I sort? How might I filter from that list page? And you can do fun things here too by showing nesting within these cards. So I might show an event, I might wanna show the group that is hosting that event. Okay, so my color coding changes here, right? I start color coding by object within a nav flow. And then I can see, okay, well, what happens if I click on a group? What happens if I click on an event? What happens if I click on a person? I'll probably go to their detail pages. And in this detail page, I'm not going to put all the attributes. I'm not going to put all the metadata and the core content that we do in object mapping. I'm really just focusing on, and some people do that. That's okay. I tend to just really focus on those nested objects, looking back at that prioritization to see what's near the top and what's near the bottom. And I can even add additional information from requirements as well here. So what I can start to see here is I can start to see if somebody is on the group, they can click over to an event. If somebody's on a person, they probably can click over to an event too. If they're on an event, they can click to the group. If they're on the person, they can click to the group. And I can start to see all this really nice cross-pollination. I can start to see the nested object matrix basically coming to life here and how a user is gonna navigate through. And this diagram is just, it's just banging. <laughs> it's just a really, really awesome diagram to start visualizing um, a system that is comprised of objects and lots of instances of those objects. So sitemaps still have their place. And I don't know if Karen's going to show anything. Maybe somebody has some show and tell ones where you could even do a sitemap nav flow hybrid. Those could exist too. But this is basically the simplest, purest form of a navigation flow. And yeah, you might have additional stuff like saying the most active at the top, or you might even start putting in some filters there, how you might say, okay, if I'm looking at people in, um, in a group, I could be able to see all members versus a leadership team. And this is basically these right here become very embryonic um, wireframes, really focusing on the relationships and letting you get that bird's eye view of how a user might pop through this system. So. To recap, the OUX law of relationships is the real world relationships should be reflected in the digital navigation. How long was that? Like, was that like 10 minutes, five minutes? Fast? Hopefully okay. it was fast. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, seeing as it, it took me about two months to wrap my brain around it. Yeah, I think that's pretty. <laughs> yeah.
Awesome. All right, Karen. Well, I'm handing it over to you. I will be in the chat um, if anybody has any questions about kind of the basics there. But yeah, take it away. All right. All right. Quite the lead up. I mean, nav flows, y'all. Okay. <laughs> So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. We're going to take a look. I am going to be switching between um, my deck and my um, Miro board because some of these, as you will see, do best when we can zoom in because there's a lot of information in them. Um, so we're going to talk about content types, taxonomies, and nav flows. Essentially, we're talking about everything that a nav flow can do and visualize and help you see in a system that traditional um, artifacts cannot. And we're going to get into that a little bit, including the sitemap. That is one of them. Um, OK, so a little bit about me. Uh, I know that Sophia did a little bit of an intro for me, but I'm Karen Ewell. Um, a few of you in the room actually have worked with me before. I've got quite a few colleagues and um, peers in the room that I've chatted with. I'm a former travel writer. I actually started as a travel writer. I moved uh, to Vietnam right out, right out of college, and then I stayed there for six years. It's all also how I found myself teaching ESL. Um, I sp specialized in teaching ESL to zero beginners, which basically meant people that didn't speak really more than a few words of English. So it was a really interesting challenge from a, a language standpoint. How do you scale someone up and uh, move someone up in understanding language? I'm also a sci-fi aficionado, which make, will make more sense in a bit. I'm really interested in quantum physics and different um, universes and the idea of world building. And I think that that's why maybe I was so drawn to nav flows, because that's essentially what it is. It's this concept of, of not so much pages, but spaces, digital domains. Um, I'm also a shiny new idea collector. I'm a lot like Sophia. I think that we have this in common. Um, I have profound ADHD. It's actually one of the reasons that I love OUX so much. It's one of the most incredible ways I've been able to capture my speedy brain at the speed that it goes and be able to document all that information without feeling like I'm going to lose it. A little bit of an idea hoarder. Um, but really, at the end of the day, I'm a UX content designer. And this is all a long way of saying that my whole life has been, my whole professional life has been stories everywhere all the time. Um, when I was an ESL teacher, I was using stories to conceptualize really simple words, verbs, nouns, adjectives. As a travel writer, I was using that to create a hook that would make someone interested in one location over another or to tell a story that was unique and not just, I stayed at this hotel and I went to this beach. As a marketer and some of the early UX kind of content work that I did, it was a lot of big picture stuff. What's going on with SEO? What are people searching for? What are they looking for? And then most importantly, how do they move through a lot of content, a lot of conflicting stories to create their own story and their own sense of meaning, which is really what I want to talk about today is nav flows are more than just data. They're more than just information and they're, they're more than just pages. They're flows of meaning. So that's what I want to introduce um, a little bit today. So I know we have a lot of content designers or kind of writers, content people in the room, which is always very exciting. But if anyone who does not call themselves a content de designer is curious what that means, it can mean a lot of different things. If you ask one content designer what they do, and then a few others, they're all going to say something a little different. Um, I've been called a UX writer, a product copywriter, a technical writer, content strategist, content engineer, which is kind of a newer one. Um, but really, I think I'm an information architecture. I'm a maker of stories. But just like I think the thing that all of these things have in common, and I would say this is probably the same of the entire UX industry, is that we are makers of meaning. It's not words that pull, pull those things together. It's stories. It's meaning. And so that's really something that's important when it comes to OUX is that OUX, content modeling, which I'll talk about in a second, is really all about understanding meaning. When we're talking about concepts and objects, we're really trying to put barriers or, or some kind of box around what are usually kind of nebulous concepts. Unless you're working with content types like an article and a white paper, sometimes you're working with things like um, vision and purpose. Sometimes you're working with really things that you wouldn't expect to be objects, they're concepts. So whenever you're working with meaning, you're working with a lot of complexity. 
So that's what's great about OUX. And we've talked about that a lot is that what it does is it brings together the abstract and the concrete. And that's what ORCA does. It moves us from that abstract space and iteratively moves us toward, toward concrete. And in doing that, we're looking at strategy, scope, structure, skeleton, which is where we start to get the nav flow piece with structure and skeleton, then finally surface, where it all comes together. And I think we all have a common enemy as well. I'm not sure how many of you get this reference. If you have ever heard of the hippo, the highest paid person in the room usually gets the final say. And the thing that I always struggled with the most was how do I visualize that this is a bad idea or that this is a good idea? How do I make sure that the things that I'm seeing, the obvious things that I think are obvious, how do I make this obvious to other people? How do I help them see the oncoming train of poor UX decisions? And OOUX, I think, nails that. And I think that's because it confidently moves people from abstract to concrete, a very uncomfortable place that very few leaders, uh, leaders and people in product are comfortable um, staying in, except for us content engineers, and I'll explain why. So what's content modeling? This is something, one of the big reasons I came into OUX is that when I saw it, I thought, is that OUX or is that content modeling? It looks a lot the same. So a content model, what I do is documenting all content types associated with a brand. Content types can also mean objects. And then define the relationships between those content types or objects. This allows us to visualize the purpose of each piece and enabling the organization of a website's content ecosystem. I think when we think about information architecture, sometimes we tend to think about the right answer. What's the right way to organize this? There is sometimes no right way. It's, it's the right way based on the context that we're in. So with that in mind, when I got into the OUX masterclass, it's probably why um, Sophia and I hit it off right away. They looked very much the same. I thought, well, what's really the difference between content modeling and OUX? We're going through the objects, we're mapping out these relationships with a domain model or a system model. We're mapping all the attributes. What's, I, I'm really excited to see like what else I can bring to this. And then I saw the nav flow and I thought, oh, this is it. This is the thing that I've been trying to figure out because in content modeling, I was used to the idea of decentralized thinking. It's not about a page, it's about an object and all the expressions of that object on the website or within a particular channel. But what I always had a really hard time visualizing was how that model worked. How did someone move through it? How would the content change? What was the benefit of using a model versus just writing a page? Why would we go through all this effort when we could just design page by page, feature by feature? Why would we do that? And this is when it, it kind of hit me. I had this moment, I think it was about two weeks in to really struggling through the relationship analysis piece, because even for me as a content modeling, content engineering person, this was hard. I couldn't, it was really hard to wrap my brain around how you can think about relationships between ideas in a way that didn't directly translate to a page and a screen. Like, how do you still separate yourself from the technology enough where you can create the right experience? So really, the reason I was having such a hard time with this for such a long time is because I was dealing with most content designers' best frenemies. We have two things that we're all often talking about. Usually you hear them synonymously, but they're actually two different things. You'll often hear voice and tone. What's our voice and tone? What's our content strategy? Our voice and tone. Well, the voice is your brand's unique personality. So it's, for example, how I sound most of the time. It can be helpful to think of this as someone as a person's voice. So my voice, how I sound generally, kind of a broad umbrella. But when you look at tone, it's more about attitude. And that changes depending on where you're at. Later on today, I'm going to be getting a, a happy hour drink with a friend. And I'm sure that I will sound very different there than I do here. That's tone. I'm the same person but I'm showing up a little differently. The tough thing about tone is that with voice, it's pretty consistent. 
a voice is a voice is a voice, a brand voice can usually be nailed down with something like content guidelines. What's harder is tone because then we start trying to capture this nebulous concept of how do you sound funny and professional and respectful and sarcastic. It's so nebulous, it's really hard to nail down. And I think that for content designers and UX writers, this is where we get stuck. It's hard for us to show why one word is better than another, or it's hard for us to sometimes demonstrate or visualize why one, shirt, why one word should follow another or not. And so for a long time, we've tried to use this concept of a tone framework, usually y-axis, x-axis, and usually showing kind of the, the structure or the, the, where it lands across a spectrum, a three-dimensional spectrum, but it's limited. Just like most, con or most uh, UX artifacts are limited in showing this. Empathy maps, they lack structure. They're very wide. They're great for brainstorming, but they lack structure. Marketing funnels, if anyone is familiar with that, those are very, very broad. You're making a lot of assumptions about marketing personas. User journeys are too narrow. It's assuming that someone is going to go in a particular order. User flows, a little too general, assuming that, every, that you know, there's only this general or generic information that someone's going to use to make a decision. Wireframes are too static. They don't move. Prototypes, you're, again, just assuming where somebody's going to click because you're engineering it into how it's built. And then tone fra frameworks are too vague. They can't anchor us in what it is that we're trying to control. So why does this all matter? I read an article about six months ago, and it, it similar to seeing the nav flow, my brain exploded. And it said, there is no perfect tone, only context. And there's the source right there. It's a really great article that was written about this. And it's essentially talking about the, the trouble with tone. It's hard to nail down tone because tone is all about what's going on around you. When we walk into a room, we look around and we read the room. We decide how we want to show up. That's why when somebody doesn't do it very well, we call them tone deaf. So it's really important to understand that when it comes to defining what the tone is, if you don't have a good sense of the inward and outward or even internal paths, you don't have an understanding of what that tone will be. You are just guessing. So why are we using models? Why content model? Why do any of this stuff? Well, it's because content and UX and human behavior is chaos. There are so many variables, millions. And any one of those variables in a split second can change someone's decision, change their path, change whatever it is that they're gonna do. Anyone who's seen a Marvel movie knows there's about a thousand different universes and that's why they'll never stop making movies. But really that's what it's about. When you're world building, when you're trying to put a barrier or a boundary around a domain or a concept, you're trying to control chaos, it's herding cats. So, I like to look at the scientific world. There's a lot of complex things out there and we can tell a lot if we have the right data and can organize it in the right way. So when I look at scientific modeling, I think it's a really good, it's a good way to look at what is content modeling. First, let's look at scientific modeling. It's a way to make a particular part or feature of the world, including a mental model, easier to define, understand, quantify, visualize, and here's the important one, simulate by referencing it to existing knowledge. If we're going to see how something is going to work and we want to test it, we need to know how things are moving through it, the systems element. Every good system has an input. So when I talk about content models, I sometimes like to use weather models as an example. Weather models are unique in that they are billions of variables that go into weather models. And weather is notoriously infinitely complex. Trying to tell the future about what the weather is going to do is really about being able to parse so much data and then making decisions about what that data means about the next decision and the next decision in terms if the weather was personified. That is what creates the system, creates the experience. Same with content models. It's not the content alone. It's not the page. It's not the word. It's not the module. It's how that module assists someone moving through that system in order to achieve a goal. So with that in mind, 
Content models, what's wrong with those? Why can't those work? Well, just like the rest of these things, they're missing something. They're missing input. Systems have input. So in order to see how something will work, you need to get it into the wild. You need to see what's gonna happen with it when a human being interacts with it. When the chaos of human behavior meets the structure of your system, what happens? So I wanted to take a closer look in Miro at maybe what's going on with some of these, uh, there, uh, these artifacts that don't work so well. Um, let me know if you can see my screen okay still, Sophia. I wanna make sure that this is switching correctly. Should be a slowly loading Miro page. Yes, slowly loading. I'm seeing some pyramids. Thinking really hard. Okay, yeah, while this through. loads, we're gonna do this real quick. Um, but what I wanna do is kind of show, look at each of those artifacts. If some of us are new to some of these artifacts, um, we can talk about those here. I apologize, this one is taking a long time to load this big board. So first one, this is a customer journey funnel. I'm sorry, it is a little bit blurry, but you can kind of get the idea. The idea is that a user moves through the funnel, more and more people drop off until you finally get to the point of purchase. And then you might expand out to advocacy. Great if people are things that you can drop in a funnel, but that's not really the case. There's a lot of nuance in here. So what about empathy maps? Well, those are kind of vague too. Yes, you're increasing information and that can be really helpful for getting in the head of the user, but you're just putting it in a location. You're not creating meaningful relationships between any of those things. Okay, so what about a customer journey? That's what those are doing, right? Well, yeah, but you're also assuming that a user is going to make a certain type of linear decision-making path. Like, yeah, there, this is the happy path. This is what's gonna happen. We know there's a lot going on in each of those stages. And arguably those are the more important decisions than the things that are happening to move them from one stage to another. Okay, so what about user flows? Well, those same thing, we're, it's really limited. We're assuming someone's going to work or move in a particular path. And we know that's not the case. Wireframes, we all know the problem with those, assuming a lot of things. And as you can see here, except for the one on this side, a lot of ipsum lorem, fake text. How are you supposed to know what you're clicking on if you don't know what it's called? And then lastly, even prototypes, even clickable prototypes are usually engineered to have one or two areas that you can click. You don't have all the options that a real user would when they're moving through a website or a system. So with that in mind, oh, let me see if I can go to full screen again, yep. What, what's the difference with the Navflow? Why do these work? so well well they're made of three things here yeah enter the net so what are they made of this is what sophia was talking about first you've got objects we know what those are the entities in the system the concepts the boxes then you've got the relationships the lines in between them how and why are those two things related but the piece that I often see missing kind of the junction the thing that happens between relationships and calls to action is intent. Why intent? Well, before someone makes a decision, they have to make the decision to make the decision. And I know that sounds a little bit funny, but there is a sometimes a split second decision and sometimes a long consideration between I've decided I think I want to do this thing and I'm going to do this thing or I've done this thing. So that I think that that's something that we call intent or that's at least what I call it. Why do I call it that? because it's using, referencing this concept called information foraging theory. So if you Google information foraging theory, that's a, there's a full dissertation on it. Nielsen Norman does a really great breakdown of it. And this is from that article. And it really uses this concept of animals foraging in the wild as a way that humans forage for information in a digital space, like a website or an app or really anywhere else, but really anywhere, right? Animals don't have a happy path. That's why they have to spend so much time foraging. They're moving down, they're finding scents of information and they're following those scents until they pick up another scent that seems more promising. If it is, then they might start moving in that direction. Those micro decisions are often what I'll hear or what I'll call micro conversions. Maybe they haven't clicked on something, 
but they've made a decision in their mind. And mapping those kinds of decisions is a really big part of content modeling because you're deciding how is this information going to make a change and how that user is going to perceive this information and potentially the direction that they're going to go. So according to this theory, when you're looking at people and how they're moving through information in a digital domain, they're usually doing something trying it called maximizing their rate of gain. So essentially it's information value. How valuable is that information to them over the cost associated with attaining that information? So it could be, I need this information in order to not get put in jail for avoiding my taxes. And going through the IRS, IRS website makes me want to throw myself off a building. So, okay, those two things together changes the information value. Okay, yeah, that might have the information that I need, but I know I'm going to hate looking at it. So I'm going to go and find it somewhere else. We know that in the world of Google, you don't have very much time to convey to someone, this has the information that you need. And most of the time, it's not the design that's making them think that. It's the words, the meaning. What is it that they're looking for subconsciously or consciously that will tell them this means the thing, the thing that I think it means and therefore is likely to have the information that I need. It has the scent of information that I'm going to follow. Okay, so what about a nav flow? I showed you that other nav flow. This is also a nav flow, but it looks different. And that's because this one is for a different purpose. Something that I'm now playing with and what we're going to jump into now is all the different ways that nav flows can be adapted to answer different kinds of questions that speak to systems, relationships, and how people interact with them. So I have, it, it, not all of these things have worked perfectly. I'm really playing with this all the time. That's why I'm so excited to do kind of the comparison and show and tell at the end. But I've used this to, um, to visualize intent, just like we were talking about, emotion, keywords that they might be looking for, categories. Sometimes they're moving through facets or categories, content types, which is a big one, Facets, if you work on nodal strategies, if you're working in the AEM, um, facets and nodes, that's always the question, is that an object or not? Make it one in a nav flow if it means that it's a, a module of meaning, um, as well as tone. Looking at that tone piece and saying, well, how does tone need to change this system? So with that in mind, let's take another close look in Mira. We're going to hope it loads. We're going to help it out by getting rid of these other things. The dog is moving around just to readjust himself. There he goes. All right. So we're going to do some zooming in here. Hang on, y'all. This is the overthinker part. This is why that's my favorite. Oops. Go to the next one. Sorry about that, guys. Let's get to the right slide. All right. Okay. So this, I'm sure, I'm sure that Sophia will recognize this. This was my nav flow from the OUX masterclass. A um, little bit of context. I was creating a nav flow for a learning community in which um, people, part of the community could both create and register for courses about speaking and presenting. So that was the concept of it. There were five objects in the system, or four? I don't even remember how many objects I ended up landing on. I think there were five. Um, and they're highlighted here. Community, which was user, inbox, which is message, classes, class, pitch, and activity. You'll notice that as you zoom in here, all those pieces that um, our friend Sophia was talking about are highlighted here. So this shows, okay, let's so, say somebody does click on community. Then what? Are they going to their profile or are they going to another community profile? If they're going to a community profile, how are they sorting and filtering? What happens then? Only then do we know after those decisions are made what that page might look like. Why? Because the My Profile page, though it shares the same model, the same basic structure, there's slightly different information there. For example, right up at the top. 
this is a nested object, a nested object relationship um, for user to class. User has one to many classes. That's what's highlighted here. But what's the difference? Why does this one look different than this one? Well, that's because this one is you. If you are looking at your profile, you probably want to see the classes that you are registered or waitlisted for first. So that's what you're going to see up top. You go to someone else's profile, yeah, you probably still want to see those classes up top, but they're different now. The context is different. Now, it's not about what that user is registered for or waitlisted for. It's about what they're coaching. Because the reason you're looking at that page is to decide whether or not you want to take a class from that person. So the priority of that attribute, of that relationship, suddenly takes a higher priority on this page on user versus profile, even though it's the same object. And that's why I split it up in the nav flow. Now let's keep going to the next piece so you can kind of see how this works. Let's say this is an ed tech project. This one, I've simplified this a little bit for, um, for the purposes of the client, but this was an area where we were looking at three different objects. And we noticed, you know, there's a lot of different relationships that provide a lot of meaning for how someone might want to interact with these. But we were pressed on time. We didn't have time to create a really fancy nav flow like this one as much as I wanted to. So we simplified it and we did this. Just the shapes and the color codes, and I'm sorry, this will load in just a second, was enough to help us start visualizing what the page looked like. And then in order to inject the right level of context, we include, I'm sorry that it's not loading, it's having a very hard time. The, with the right level of context, we are able to add additional cards on top to say, this is the type of relationship that's highlighted here. This is the type of relationship that's highlighted here. Same object, different context. You don't always have to group them all together if the use is different. So someone might be looking at insights that precede or follow an article that they're looking at. Or maybe they want to look at other insights made by that same creator. If they're looking to find an insight that precedes or follows, their intent is probably more like, what else comes after this? What else do I need to do? But if they click on one of the insights in related to it via the creator, the same creator created this insight as the one that you're looking at right now, they're probably deciding, is this person does this person know enough for me to listen to them? Are they trustworthy? So the way that you show that object is going to be a little different. It needs to be consistent enough that it's recognizable, yes, but it can be different enough where it helps someone understand, someone understand why they're clicking on it. It provides context. And when you're designing in that way, you can start to make better decisions about the order of information as, as it's presented on in the experience, which is the essence of prioritization. So I want to show you one other application before a few other kind of very odd different applications that I've used. This one is called a page flow. So this is where it's starting to dance toward um, kind of the sitemap piece. The intention of this is showing the flow between different pages. But the purpose of this now flow was less about the nested relationships. I was less worried about just the navigation, and I was more worried about the drill down. Why? What's the purpose of this page versus this page if they share the same model? Why are they different? Well, the reason here was facets. If someone is looking at all resources listed, for example, and I'm sorry this is blurry, but all resources that are listed, the purpose of that might be, oh, I need you to assist me in finding the right thing. The stage that they're at might be more like awareness, consideration. They don't know what you've got going on. They just want to take a look at all of it. Then they see something that they like and they go, oh, wait, hold up. I think you have a resource type that I really like. You have a lot of videos. That's cool. So they click and they click and they see, oh, man, you have a lot of videos. So now they've moved down a level. They're still looking for you to assist them, but they have a little more intent now. They found something that they like. So what might they do next? Maybe they'll apply a theme now. Okay, well, maybe just show me videos 
that are about this thing. Can, can you show me that? Oh, wow, this is so interesting. So they click on one of those and they get down there. Oh, this is really interesting. Uh, okay, of all of these videos about this theme, this one seems like the most relevant to, the, uh, to what I think I might need. So they click. That might not be the end of the journey. Yes, they found one thing that they need. What if there's an insight that's related to it? And they're interested in it because it's about the same theme. What if there's a user that downloaded that resource and they want to know why that user downloaded it? They might go the other way. You don't always know what question is in someone's mind and therefore the decision that they're going to make next to fulfill that information need. You might always want to move them toward a call to action, but they not, might not be ready yet. And to try and do so without the right information is likely to make them more frustrated than it is in helping them. So last piece, this is where I had the most fun. And that's because this is my own personal project. I'm reworking my own website. And that this is where I did a more traditional math flow. So you'll see here, looks a little bit more like tradition, traditional math flow, got lots of nested things in here. But this was where I wanted to play around and see, well, this is a lot to look at. It's a lot of detail. You got a lot of words in there. Look how much you have to scroll. There's a lot of lines. It's a lot to look at here. It's a little overwhelming. So what if I just wanted to help people see the taxonomy? I just want them to see the tags and the filters and the categories. I just want them to see that. That's where something like this might come in. Starting to look a little more directional, a few more lines. We're making some assumptions. But this way I'm able to highlight, okay, what's the listing? What's the object? Okay, and now what filters and facets might be applied here? What might people click to move down to the next level? If you're familiar with ontologies, you might be familiar with upper and lower ontologies, broader and narrower terms. This is a great way to visualize that. They might not be ready to see all those terms, but once they click on one thing, maybe they are because they're drilling down. So this has been one of my favorite ways to visualize that drill down. Um, this is especially true, and I won't go into this, Sophia, but tree systems. In many very complex systems, certain objects will be inherited by other objects, which will be inherited by other objects, kind of like a family tree. That is sometimes what's happening here. And by visualizing it like this, you can show how someone might narrow down to what they need, which can be a really helpful way of visualizing decisions. Last two pieces I want to show you. So imagine you want to know what the intent is. Why would someone click on this? What question are they trying to answer? Imagine this is a home page. Obviously, this is not everything that's on the page. I have just listed out the landing pages and the listing pages, as well as any relevant faceted listing pages. And then I've drawn a line from each of them. In addition to the color code to say, hey, this is the kind of page it is, gray for landing, blue for object, um, pink for a faceted or metadata data applied piece, I'm also writing what's the question they're most likely to be asking themselves right now. And therefore, when they click on the services page and land on the services landing, what do they need to see first? If their question is, what do you have to offer? They click on that on services landing, hoping to see what you have to offer. The first thing they should probably see is projects. Then they're probably gonna wonder, well, what types of projects do you have? Okay, so maybe you have them grouped by type. Uh, then they're gonna go, well, what's, what's involved in those? Maybe there's activities. Okay, well, what comes out of those activities? Oh, the artifacts. Okay, can I see other projects? So you can see the natural micro conversions as someone moves through a page. Are they reading every word? No, they're scrolling really fast and they're scanning for the information that they need. As you can see, there's a lot of decisions being made here. Are they always moving in the same path? No, they're going to be moving all over the place. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes people need more information to feel confident to make a next step. Sometimes they don't. So by providing this level of flexibility, you are better enabling the inherent chaos of content and how people use it in a digital world. The last piece, and there's a guy, Bill, in here who's going to be especially excited about this. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with this is Pluchik. Is it Pluchik's? Pluchik's chart. 
emotions, color coded emotions, um, the 16 different emotions at different ranges. I love these color codes. They're not a perfect system. They're not an exact science, but they can be a really helpful way of thinking about how a user might feel and how that interacts with their intent. So I took the same thing and I color coded it. Okay, why should I trust you? They're moving from the projects listing, a list of all the projects that I do. And now they're looking at all the client projects. So why did they go from project listing and now they just wanna see client projects? They're probably thinking, why should I trust you? Tell me all the other clients that have trusted you before. They're looking for social proof. So what's the emotion they're most likely to be feeling? Probably a little bit of this, maybe a little anticipation, maybe a little bit of vigilance. And you know what, if they've been burned by client or if they've been burned by contractors before, maybe a little bit of this. So being prepared for that intent or that emotional state as they come in can be really helpful from when it comes to tone. Will it tell you what words to use? No, but it will give you a frame of reference, more context to be able to make decisions about why a word should be what it is, why a component should look and feel the way that it should, and how to test it to see if it worked based on what you thought that component or that page was gonna be able to do for the user. So as you can see, this, these nav flows, it's all the same thing. These are all the same concept, but they look so different from each other. And they're all achieving a different thing. They're visualizing something different. What they all have in common is that they're capturing a lot of chaos. And that's what these do. That's what content modeling does. And that's what, um, that's what OUX does. It helps you capture that chaos, visualize it, and simulate it in order to test it. So with that in mind, I know we're gonna be opening it up. I hope people have a lot of questions. I love talking about this stuff. Please follow me on LinkedIn. Um, please go on my website. It's not the updated one yet. When I update it, you'll see this, all of this stuff come to life. But um, I hope that I've gotten you excited about Navflows and I'm excited to see what y'all have been working on. Awesome, Karen, thank you so much. So if everybody wants to go off mute for just a second and we're gonna give a round of applause. So just like 10 seconds. Woo! Woo! Yay! Woo! Great job. Hey. Good job. Awesome, awesome. Okay, <laughs> thanks guys. <laughs> All right, um, so do we have any questions? We've got a few more minutes. Um, or does anybody have a nav flow that they want to get feedback on that they want to show? I have a few queued up that I can show, but I, I definitely. I wanted to ask a question about intent. Um, and I do have something I could share in IA that I've created. It's not a nav flow in the same style as yours, but it was done, I don't know, I don't want to say how many years ago. So <laughs> we'll leave that out of it. Um, yes. In, in terms of intent, um, I'm really curious the way in which you're stuffing that out. Um, you know, you've you've got it there, and I love how you sort of went through the phases of discovery to considering to yes, I'm in, let's go, or maybe even expert. Um, but I'm I'm curious how you're pairing this work with research. Um, to capture that. So that's one thing. And then I'm happy to share uh, if there aren't any other questions, an, an example of how I've captured intent inside of a flow. Yeah, this I think it's a really interesting question because it's something that I'm still working out the best ways to do it. I use a lot of the concepts of this um, noun foraging and attribute foraging. I've started applying the same uh -huh. concept and I call it intent foraging. So it's a lot like social listening or um, like maybe I, I also love looking at cu customer call transcripts, social um, posts, chat transcripts. And then in the later stages, when you're actually prototyping things, I love to do speak alouds, mainly because if, especially if you ask someone, can you tell me what you're thinking about? What questions come up for you? What's great is that I think that a lot of those questions are actually very simple. What does this mean? How does this relate to this thing? They're usually not very technical or super in-depth, which means that I find in a lot of cases, you can kind of group them together. And over time, you start to see that there's kind of a general pattern of 
types of intent that you can usually group of like, okay, these are higher level, like, what is it? How does it work versus am I eligible for this? You can kind of see that's a little lower, but every industry is different. Every user is different. I've also done it like a card sort where I write questions down. I have them create new questions. I have them group them, categorize them, and then put them on a user flow. That has been a really great way to ideate new ones. Um, I'm, I would love to hear other people's thoughts because I know SEO keyword analysis can be a great way to do it. There, I think there's just so many ways you can get that information. Great. Anyone else want to throw anything else in the bucket there? Don, I want to see your diagram. If you have it, okay. You have yeah, it I, have it. I have it queued up. I, do. I don't, I don't do understand Zoom permissions. So you have to tell me if you can't share. Okay. Hey, hey. All right. So I'll give just a high level um, introduction to this. So I was hired to lead this sort of design content strategy and information architecture from Mount Holyoke College, which was one of the first out of maybe 12 colleges that merged together library and technology in order to further the library in a you know, technology dominated world. So one of the things that you're going to see here, and I'll, I'll zoom in, sort of the high level lit library information technology services. And I did some color coding to kind of break out sort of what was in technology. So imagine like changing your password on the college, getting your username and password login that gives you access to all the services around the college, being able to check out hardware or software, you know, all kinds of things around printing and, and access, you know, are in that technology department. And then on the other side, you have the library, which I think Karen was getting into a little bit where you have, you know, deep, deep reservoirs of assets that you can access. But if you think about a library, you know, from, from a user intent, it really goes from, you know, someone who's just coming in from the first time to discover something all the way to a highly, you know, trained expert faculty member that's actually going in and doing, you know, postdoc research or training students in certain things. So how do you create, you know, an organizational structure that addresses all these different intents or use cases? And so in order to, to, to start to digest it, I, I got into this thing here and the way I, I described the intent was like this, new to the topic. So I'm, I'm kind of coming in for the first time. I may not even know what the word is for the thing, right? I, I just know that I need to do something on Shakespeare for my literature course. And I know that he wrote, you know, a few plays and I'm just getting into it as a fresh, you know, fresh student, you know, first year at college. Um, and so browsing is really helpful, lib guides and various types of things, blogs, social media, obviously Google search is a pre-search. Most of the time is how they start, start to get the words in hand. And then it goes all the way down to, you know, the research level thought intent where no stone is left unturned and they're really getting into the deep, deep reservoirs of, of what's available through the stacks, what's available through all the online software. Um, and then you can sort of see the movement in the same way. It's different, but similar to, to some of the things that Karen was talking about. Um, and then here on the, the technology side is like, I need to know, you know, I have a how-to question that has a specific answer, knowledge bases, I want to do something um, and how do I pull that up? Or my tech problem is more involved. I actually need to get involved with a chat person or a chat bot or, you know, an actual support staff or have diagnostics of my computer because I can't get into it. Um, or I need to actually do some work. I need to find a space in the library. I need to be able to get a gadget. I want to do a presentation or, or learn something from lynda.com or Moodle. Um, so, so essentially, you know, creating that unified single search around all of that, but then being able to to use the intent or the quotes of the individual to, to drive this. So I, I just want to say I'm really excited um, to see that someone else is like taking the OOUX and then also paired it with this intent piece because to parse something this complex required getting into the sort of where someone is coming from, this intent piece to be able to structure a navigation that was useful in the end. And it ended up being iconography. The iconography was all through the library space and then the buildings around the campus. Um, it also in, turned into the, you know, the drop downs that had both the intent of where they were along with like the formal words. Um, so anyways, I just, I just 
really cool stuff. Love seeing it. And thank you so much for, for sharing. This is, I mean, what you just showed is really, it's kind of like, it takes the customer journey funnel. It's, it turns it on its side and it turns it into, uh, you know, like that timeline. And I think when you have those awesome categories and then saying, okay, these are the content types most likely to meet that and meet that intent. What if you broke it down even further? What if every single attribute on each of those objects had an associated intent? What if it, what if it had multiple? What if each one piece of information, one piece of metadata could answer a hundred questions for a hundred different users? That's where we start to get to the point where we can take these massive ontologies, these massive groups of information and organize them across a, a landscape that makes sense. As you learn more, you know more, you can scaffold up. Just as you're learning a language, like a new language like English, you need to scaffold. And so building language and ontologies using intent as a way to understand how someone might build that knowledge can be a really powerful way to make it much more user focused. So I'm really excited to see that beautiful diagram because it's very similar to what I'm doing. So I have a question um, for both Karen and Dawn. Um, so I feel like when it comes to assumptions about our users, like I feel like there's, like when it comes to a library, I can tell you what the things are in the library with zero assumptions. Like I know there's going to be books, <laughs> right? I know that there, I, if you bring the diagram back up, I can like probably start noun foraging that diagram and start finding, okay, we've got books, we've got um, tickets. Like, so you can submit a ticket. It looks like there's other things that are just truth. But when it comes to, yeah, okay, so we've got, like, you even have library materials. Yes, articles, like, that's what I went straight into. Like, that's where we have no assumptions. So I want to make it so easy for them to find those things. Like, can you find books, journals, articles, DVDs, um, topic might even be, or, like, category, section, department. I think I saw department. Um, thesis facts is interesting. Um but like being able to, like these facts, like is maybe like a user generated thing that you can put your thesis facts in. Um, like my print credits, like all those things are zero assumptions. Like, the, like we just know right. that those things exist and that people need to find them. So with intent, like is somebody coming to discover or coming to learn, right? I, like well, Dawn, or I, research. I, I feel like it just gets squishier. Well, Dawn, I wonder if you have thoughts on this. I think squishy is okay. Chaos, mm -hmm. human behavior is squishy. I think what is unique here is that um, I think that that's where it's helpful to talk to users and ask. I mean, what really is, if you look at it in the same way that we do semantic um, analysis between objects, what is the difference between discovering something and learning something? What's different? Mm -hmm. Like, what are the questions? How are those different? So it thinking of it from that way is helpful, I think. I think like the, the definitions here are really good, but I don't know if this ended up as the main navigation, but I do see verb-based main navigation a lot. And usually it's like, it's tough. It's like, do I want to discover or do I want to research? <laughs> like, it's, you know, it's kind of like hard for a user to say which one they want to do. Yeah, so this did not become a one-to-one -one for the mm -hmm. navigation. The navigation actually you can go to the website and it's still live. So it had it had it, it was worth its weight in salt. Uh, so it, it definitely stuck around. Um, so so you can see here that you're right, these materials are fixed things, whether or not they're virtual mm -hmm. or actual hard copies, and they fall under the discover, learn, research continuum. So a book could be, you know, accessed by someone who's new to the topic, expanding their knowledge, or no stone left unturned. And the important part is, is that the way in which they, they find this material mm -hmm. is basically outline, I called them UI elements because OOUX didn't exist at the time, right? So I just, I was like, there, there's these, these methods by which you can find something. So they had, we had things like trending topics, right? And a trending topic could then lead you to this. So it was like a browsing, yeah. a browsing based form because you could put in a keyword search, but then it would have to have associative results. Um, LibGuides was like introduction to a topic. So famous playwrights, for example, would be a libguide. And inside mm. that, it would have Shakespeare. And inside that, it would have books. Whereas if you were a researcher, 
you would know Hamlet, you would know, you know, passages from that, you would know, you know, how that was inspired and maybe the era and a variety of other things. So it's going to, it's going to lead you to maybe the same book as someone from Discover, but for different intent and purpose. Right? Can I ask a question of you, Don? Because that's really interesting to me. Okay, what happens if, because somebody asked me this the other day, what's ha what happens if it's the same person at a different time? Yes. Like, same. And, right. Like, yes. like you can be a, the same person and depending on your context of knowledge for a particular topic, like let's say that's it's a right. massive, you might know history, but you don't know another genre. And that's, that's exactly it. So we had individuals like that that were experts but then they took an elective in something they knew nothing about. So the same person that had just gone over here and pulled up, you know, some highly specific database that you can only get if you're a college student or pay lots of money per month to do research on their, their thesis had in the same day used a LibGuide to, to look at something around a contemporary artist because they didn't know nothing about art in their scientists. Yeah. So at CNN, we had a thing because we, we kind of got away from instead of having personas at CNN.com, this is like everybody <laughs> personas at CNN is hard. We had mindsets and we had like the it was it like lean in, which would maybe be the researcher. And then we had like the lean back, which is like it's my lunch break and I just want to scroll. And like, we had, I think five of these different mindsets, which kind of like, and you could be different one, like, like sometimes it's like, oh my gosh, I, there's this topic that I want to know exactly about. I want to like follow up on that. This, this very like lean in researchy. Um, yeah. Which was a similar kind of like the mindset was like correlated to intent, I think. Yes. I, I love that. That's a fun and mindsets. It gives you a fun way, you know, intent, it gets into this whole like, okay, do I, am I in tune with myself? But a mindset is like, I'm approaching it from this. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm back here. I'm on the fence versus, whoa, I'm, I'm, I think there was a point to Sophia when you were like this, <laughs> when Karen yeah. was presenting, you know, it, it's yeah. really, it's a different, a different way of engaging a different um, right. energy that you're bringing to it. So I think a really interesting way of looking at it too, is that if you're dealing with a topic that is particularly dense or especially really complex B2B spaces, niche B2B spaces, I learned this from teaching ESL, like some students will come in and not want to say a word, but if you can scaffold them up to a certain point, they're just by their interaction with a system or with that will change the way that they interact with the system. So I'm currently working with this amazing client that does change or cause-based marketing. And a lot of it is like, how do you use behavioral economics to, to drive positive change? And I think that that's why I've become so interested in this. And how can a single word change how somebody feels about a topic like mm. job loss or rights or things like mm. that? So I, I think that this is such an interesting space, especially for UX researchers to come in and start to see how to really test these things. Like, yes, we can make these assumptions, but then how do we really test intent? That's where I'm starting to play now is like, how do you really make sure that that assumption was right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so I saw a presentation a couple of days ago and apologies, I just, I'm, I'm, I've got this link and then I'll, I'll pipe down here. Um, Irrational Labs is actually blending behavioral psychology with user research to improve the patient experience for um, individuals that are dealing with healthcare, you know, issues, whether it's, I don't understand how to use my insurance and I need to go to the doctor or, you know, I have this, you know, ongoing issue and I need to schedule a test or find someone to help me with it, right? And so, I had never seen that pairing between it. And, and to your question around how are they evaluating assumptions, um, I got into that specifically because I want to know, like, are they creating a control in the study? And then, you know, because it really starts to get into issues of like equity and access. You, know, you have to be really careful when you're messing around with healthcare content and content modeling in order to make sure that everyone um, has that, that equitable access. So he said that they're actually doing control groups and then they're doing A-B testing, right? So they, and then I said, well, how are you determining who's in the control, right? Like, is the company deciding that? Or are you actually going through and making sure that it's equitable? Um, so, so that is definitely worth looking into some of the case studies that they've published. It's called Irrational Labs. Um, it, was, it was really brilliant. I love that you brought in the behavioral piece because that starts to get into 
the psychology behind things um, and, and pairs really nicely with, with the user experience research techniques that we've been you know, honing over the last 15 years. I have a theory okay. that like, <laughs> excuse me, that um, there's like, we have every person has a different mental model of something. They have a different mental model of the space. We bring, we do our research to kind of normalize those mental models as much as possible into the conceptual model that we literally have to code into software. <laughs> we have to have a conceptual model that it becomes our the pillars of our system. That's that's the architecture. That's the orca, basically, right? Is that when we bring all of that together, the objects, the relationships, what people can actually do to them, and then all the information, all the attributes. So we have all these mental models. We try to like work so that they kind of that, that mental model is normalized. So it's a conceptual model, makes the sense, makes sense to the most people. And then people have that, they come into the conceptual model of the space that we built. We've designed that, designed that conceptual model. And then they come in with their different intents at different times of the day or depending on who they are. And how can the system basically, whether it's through the UI elements or through voice and tone, or even through those different, like the different ways those nested objects manifest, the different, these different main macro intents can be covered by that same conceptual model. And what's powerful about that is that if you are, and you know, this is why I say just like object map everything, because if you model your KPIs in an object oriented ontological way, like a tree, you can do roll up data to say, how well are we performing in comprehension? How well are we performing in speed? Like really, that's why I'm just like object orient everything y'all model everything. Because when you model things and you break things down into small pieces, you can engineer them. If you can make things small enough and kind of match, it's like language. You need a translation. And in order to make something translate, you need to make kind of look the same. So like words, vocabulary, nouns, verbs, those are basic things that exist in language. So why not use that as the basis for meaning? It's how we construct meaning anyway. So that's why I love content designers. And I think they're so connected to OUX is because you're, you're developing meaning. And it, that's really about this kind of really nebulous, uncomfortable space of, well, we have to make some assumptions and then we have to test it. That's why I love this because it actually allows you to test human emotion, which is inherently, infinitely complex. And that's a good place to drop the mic. <laughs> Karen, thank you so much. Don, thank you too for going into the hot seat. Um, really cool. Um, hopefully we will see y'all on May the 4th. We'll make all sorts of Star Wars jokes um, where Cheryl Kababa is going to be speaking about her book. Um, so make sure to RSVP. I'm going to be reading the book this month. So it'll be kind of like book clubby too. Um, and uh, I'm putting discount code one more time into the chat um, for the masterclass. So if you want to dig deep and go ahead and take the masterclass, um, it is there waiting for you. And that discount code will be good through like end of day on Monday. So talk to you, Ross, get the money for it. And uh, I'll see you in the Slack channel, hopefully. Cool. All right, y'all. Cheers. All right. Happy Thanks, OUXing. Thank you. Mm -hmm.